And it's very traditional that in a teaching on wisdom, particularly if the teaching is about this wisdom of emptiness, that at the beginning of the teaching um, we would read the Heart Sutra together. So let's read the Heart Sutra together so at least we can start to become familiar with some of the words of the Heart Sutra. Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain in Rajgir, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Aryanavalikateshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Chauputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odour, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on, up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including, no ageing and death, and no extinction of ageing and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Chariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of Nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, Om, Gate, Gate, Parakati, Parasam Gati, Bodhisvaha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavadriputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Aryabhlakiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras and Gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan.
So what we notice here in this Heart Sutra that we have is we actually have the Heart Sutra, but also embedded in the Heart Sutra we see a number of outlines. And these outlines, outlines are coming from a Tibetan commentary on the Heart Sutra. And these outlines help us to understand what are each of the sections of the Heart Sutra uh, talking about and how the different sections of the Heart Sutra relate to each other. So we're using this structure to help us better understand the Heart Sutra. So let's begin by having a look at the title here, the full title. And often it's simply called the Heart Sutra, or here um, it's given a slightly longer title in English, the Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And underneath that, we have the original Sanskrit title of the Heart Sutra. So this Heart Sutra was written down in the Sanskrit language. And the Sanskrit title here is Arya Bhagavati Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra. One of the challenges that we often face when we receive teachings on Buddhism in English or any other modern day language is simply terminology. Because often we find that terms in the original Sanskrit or Pali languages, often these terms have no exact equivalent word in English that has the same meaning. So often the translator is forced to try to find a word in English or other languages that sort of approximates the original Sanskrit term. But unfortunately, often that word in English and other languages has other meanings that we normally associate with that word that are not part of the meaning, the original Sanskrit meaning. So what I like to do and what I think is very important is when we come across very important concepts in Buddhism, it's very helpful to go back to the original Sanskrit term to really define precisely what that term means so that when we hear the word in English, we know what it means in the Buddhist context. Otherwise, we can have a lot of confusion about Buddhism simply through terminology problems. And also here, what we find is, of course, this Heart Sutra was written in Sanskrit and the version we have here was then translated into Tibetan and then from Tibetan to English. But even when the Sanskrit was translated into Tibetan, and usually you find this in all Tibetan texts that are translations of the original Sanskrit texts, is that the title will be translated into Tibetan Plus, you'll see the, type, the original title in Sanskrit in the text. And there is a couple of reasons why they retain the Sanskrit title in Tibetan and here also in English. It's to understand that this text is not somehow an English or Tibetan invention, but it's actually an one of the original texts from the Sanskrit tradition. But also to give us some sort of connection with the Sanskrit language. That's why we see the, the title here is maintained in Sanskrit. So let's have a look at the Sanskrit title and try to understand the words of the Sanskrit title. So again, the title is Arya Bhagavati Prashna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. So let's look at Prashna Paramita first. So, Prajna is the Sanskrit term which usually is translated into English as wisdom. And paramita has a couple of ways of looking at that term. One is that paramita is coming from the root Sanskrit of parama.
And parama in English uh, often is translated as perfection. So the most common way of translating prajna paramita is perfection of wisdom. That's the most common translation you'll see. But paramita can also be divided into two, para and mita. means beyond and meter means going or gone so often then when it's translated in this way we have parach and parameter as the wisdom gone beyond or going beyond or sometimes you'll hear the term uh, going to the other shore so what we're talking about here is the wisdom that can help us to go beyond suffering to achieve liberation from suffering, to achieve nirvana or enlightenment in this case. So that's the etymology of this. It's the wisdom which can help us to go beyond suffering. But more commonly it's translated as perfection of wisdom. And here we have the perfection of wisdom or the wisdom of going or gone beyond and it means to go beyond suffering. But we can talk about two distinct goals. We can talk about nirvana and enlightenment. Nirvana, of course, is a Sanskrit term. Enlightenment is a translation of the Sanskrit word bodhi. And as we're going to see in the Heart Sutra here, is these are stages in the path. That first, we can achieve the goal of Nirvana, where we have gone beyond suffering samsara, what's called samsara, achieve the goal of nirvana, which is personal liberation from suffering. But here the idea of going beyond is really talking about the goal of enlightenment. That to achieve the goal of enlightenment so that the further goal of enlightenment so that we can help to liberate everyone else from suffering. And so to <coughs> strive for this goal of enlightenment we have to develop an aspiration for enlightenment and that aspiration is called bodhicitta so remember body is enlightenment and citta means mind so bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment it's the mind which aspires to enlightenment so that we can help to liberate others from suffering. So then when we talk about the perfection of wisdom or the wisdom going or gone beyond, we're talking about the wisdom which enables us to achieve enlightenment. And of course that wisdom is this wisdom of emptiness. But for that wisdom of emptiness to enable us to achieve enlightenment, that has to, of course, come together with bodhicitta, the aspiration for enlightenment. If we don't have this, the wisdom of emptiness will only enable us to achieve nirvana. So here in the Heart Sutra, when we talk about perfection of wisdom or the wisdom going beyond, we're talking about the wisdom of emptiness. In other words, the realization of emptiness together with bodhicitta. Because that will enable us to go beyond and achieve the goal of enlightenment. So then when we see the word 
perfection of wisdom, this is what it means. Perfection of wisdom is the realization of emptiness together with the aspiration of bodhicitta. Because that is what enables us, that is the perfection of wisdom, and that enable that is the wisdom that enables us to go beyond samsara and achieve the goal of enlightenment. Clear? So at any time, in anything I'm talking about today or tomorrow, if you have any doubts or questions, please raise your hand. I like to be very interactive. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Right, right. So, Prajna Paramita, we can talk about that means the perfection of wisdom or the wisdom that enables us to go beyond. So, here, going beyond or the perfection is we're talking about the wisdom that can enable us to achieve enlightenment. The wisdom that enables us to go beyond suffering of course, is the wisdom of emptiness. <coughs> and again, not just intellectual understanding of emptiness, a realisation of emptiness. But here, when we talk about perfection or going beyond, we're not just talking about nirvana, we're talking about enlightenment. This goal of enlightenment. So for the wisdom of emptiness to enable us to achieve enlightenment, it has to come together with this aspiration of bodhicitta. So the perfection of wisdom is a realization of emptiness that comes together with bodhicitta, the aspiration of bodhicitta. That's perfection of wisdom. Okay. So here in the title again, Ari Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. Um, sutra really means the uh, words of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha. So anything that's called a sutra is a teaching from the Buddha. And then of course we can have texts or teachings that come from uh, Indian masters, Tibetan masters, and other masters. These are like called commentaries. But if it's called a sutra, it means it's a teaching of the Buddha. And the teachings of the Buddha, we can sort of divide them into what's called the three turnings of the wheel. So the first turning of the wheel, teachings of the Buddha, were the Four Noble Truths. And in the Four Noble Truths, this is the foundation of all Buddhist traditions. And the Four Noble Truths includes teachings which help us to achieve the goal of Nirvana. But there's another set of teachings called the Perfection of Wisdom teachings. Which is called the Second Turning of the Wheel. And these teachings, which of course the Heart Sutra is part of these teachings, these teachings help us to achieve the goal of enlightenment. And then there was a third turning of a set of teachings and the main topic there was Buddha nature. Which is also a set of teachings relating to achieving enlightenment. But in particular, these teachings here also are uh, a little bit of a bridge into what's called Tantra. So all of these teachings here are sutras. 
But then we can also talk about Tantra, or Vajrayana sometimes called. And Tantra is also a system of teachings <coughs> for achieving enlightenment. But in Tantra, we are trying to gain access to a deeper level of our mind. A very subtle mind, it's called. And so these teachings on Buddha nature is a little bit of a bridge into that. So the Heart Sutra here is part of this second turning of the wheel, these perfection of wisdom teachings. So that's where the Heart Sutra comes in all the various teachings of the Buddha. And here it's called Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra. Hridaya here means heart or essence. So that's what's been translated here as Heart Sutra. So the word heart here is not somehow talking about sort of emotions or something like that. The word heart, in English we have, you know, come to the heart of the matter. What is the essence? So here the word heart means essence. Because what we see in this Heart Sutra, it's very short. There's not many words. In fact, there are a number of Perfection of Wisdom teachings. The extensive Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is a teaching that has 100,000 stanzas. The middling level is 25,000 stanzas. Each stanza, of course, is four lines or verse. The short Perfection of Wisdom Sutra is only 8,000 stanzas long. The Heart Sutra has 25 stanzas. So it's very short. So it really, in very few words, it contains the essence of all of these Perfection of Wisdom teachings. That's why it's called the Heart Sutra. Unclear in what sense? What they are? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a short answer now, but we're going to sort of touch back onto this a little bit later. But a brief answer is the Four Noble Truths was the very first teachings that the Buddha gave. And in the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha was being like our doctor, diagnosing what is our current condition. And in the First Noble Truth, he said that that was, and this is in English most transla often translated as suffering. But this is a classic example of how terminology can be very confusing. Because we normally see this, and you often hear this, that the First Noble Truth is translated as the truth of suffering. And then you'll hear people say things like, according to Buddhism, all life is suffering. And then when we hear that, we go, oof, that doesn't sound, doesn't sound right. Because when we hear the word suffering, for us, that, seems, that means some, some sort of unpleasant, painful, physical or mental experience. That's the word suffering for us. But the word that the Buddha used to describe what is our condition, he said it's dukkha. Very difficult word to translate in English. In fact, I think there's no word in the English language that has that meaning. Sometimes people translate it as unsatisfactory. The second noble truth, of course, is why are we stuck in this state of dukkha? The second noble truth is the cause or origin of that. And this is where we see that the Buddha saw that the reason we're stuck in this state is because of our mental afflictions. Particularly what's underlying our mental afflictions like attachment, aversion, jealousy and so forth is our distorted view of reality. And here in the Four Noble Truths teachings the Buddha said that the, the underlying distortion of reality is that we overinflate the sense of me. That we overinflate the sense of me and we grasp onto what's called self. 
So we have an overinflated sense of me, a distorted view of how we exist. This, in the Four Noble Truths, is the root of all of our problems, the root of all of our mental afflictions and suffering. If we can overcome this distorted view of person, of me, i.e., what's said is realize no self, then we can achieve the goal of nirvana. So here in the Four Noble Truths teachings, how we see the world is not a problem. There is an objective world out there. No problem. The only problem is how we see ourselves as a person. We overinflate the sense of me, we grasp onto self. That's the problem here that we need to get rid of. In the perfection of wisdom teachings, the Buddha went on to say, that's a problem, but there's some deeper problem than that. Because in the perfection of wisdom teachings, he said, actually, how we see the world is also a problem. That there is no objective world out there. There's no independent world there. There's no independent me here. This is the idea of emptiness. So what we see is that, based on the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha here went a little bit further and said there's a deeper problem going on than just grasping onto self. And that's what we're looking at this weekend, the deeper problem, to come to realize there's no independent me, no independent objective world. But we'll come back to this more in the text later. Uh, if I understood well, so once we have a realiza realization and the Ichika, we are enlightened. We have enlightenment. And is it then when compassion comes naturally? Right. Oof, a lot to be said about this. Uh, short answer. We need emptiness and bodhicitta to achieve enlightenment. Does that mean as soon as we realize emptiness with bodhicitta, we're enlightened? No. We need to do that again and again and again and again, many times. So that's one point. Um, and the second part of your question was again? Is it then? Oh, right. The compassion arises? Right. So, and we'll look at this a little bit later. Um, when we look at emptiness, what we will really come to realize, now emptiness is, or what we have now is that there seems to be a me here, and a them there. And we seem to be separate, independent. Which means actually it's very difficult to fully develop love and compassion because, you know, I'm here, they're there, their own business. But emptiness is saying there's no me here and them there. Of course it's me and them, but we're not somehow separate. So if we realize emptiness, the flip side of that is that we'll realize there's no separation between ourselves and anyone else. So merely realizing emptiness, regard, forgetting about bodhicitta, the realization of emptiness itself will lead to spontaneous compassion arising. But compassion is not the same as bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is one step further, and we'll look at that. Then, in the title, we have also Arya Bhagavati. So this word Arya here, again a Sanskrit word, it's referring to person. And there are two levels of practitioner, someone who's following the spiritual path. There is what's called an ordinary practitioner and an Arya practitioner. So an Arya practitioner is anyone who has directly realized emptiness. So when we practice the path and we come to directly realize emptiness, if we, of course, previously have developed bodhicitta, so someone who's developed bodhicitta, of course, is called a bodhisattva, So, again, body is enlightenment. Sattva here means courage or strength. 
So a bodhisattva is someone who has the courage or strength to strive for enlightenment. So when we develop bodhicitta, we're called a bodhisattva. And then as a bodhisattva, we're following the path to enlightenment. And so when that bodhisattva has a realization of emptiness, direct, they become Arya Bodhisattva. And then, when that Bodhisattva achieves enlightenment, they of course become Buddha. They, technically, they become an Arya Buddha. And that's what the title here is. It says, Arya Bhagavati. Bhagavati is the feminine of Bhagavan. And in Bhagavan, we can divide it into two. The second part, the suffix, van means to possess. And the first part, bhaga here, can mean a couple of things. One, it means that uh, we have destroyed or eliminated something. And a Bhagavan is another word for Buddha. So a Bhagavan, or a Buddha, is someone who has destroyed or eliminated something. And what has a Buddha eliminated is what's called the two obscurations, which we'll look at later. So we won't discuss now. But here, in the title, we don't see Arya Bhagavan, we see Arya Bhagavati. So the T-I suffix is feminine. So here, we're talking about the perfection of wisdom producing the Buddha. But the Buddha, the Bhat, is referred to in the feminine. Why? Is because we can talk about two wings of practice. The two wings of practice in Sanskrit is prajna and upaya. Prajna, of course, as we've seen, is wisdom. And upaya is translated sometimes as method or skillful means. So here we're talking about how we act in the world. And all of our actions in the world are to be based on compassion. So often this wing is called the compassion wing. So the two wings of practice are wisdom and compassion. And here we see that the wisdom wing is considered feminine and the method wing, compassion wing, is masculine. Intuitively it may seem more obvious to have them opposite. Maybe. Certainly compassion, I think women are generally more compassionate than men. I think for biological reasons more than anything. But here in Buddhism, wisdom is considered feminine and compassion or method masculine. The reason is, what we can understand is that it's the wisdom of emptiness that gives birth to Arya beings. If we want to become an Arya, we need to realize emptiness. So, because women give birth to children, therefore the wisdom of emptiness gives birth to Arya beings, therefore wisdom is feminine. And then... Upaya or method is talking about how we approach the path. And what we undersee, and we'll see this a little bit later in the Heart Sutra, there are what's called different lineages 
different approaches to practice. We can talk about, and we'll look at this later, three types of lineages. And historically, the, in the family, the lineage of the family was determined by the father. If the father had a certain profession, the son had the same profession. So the lineage, or in historically in the family, was determined by the father. So similarly here, then this is considered masculine. So that's the way of understanding um, feminine and masculine. And that's why we have Arya Bhagavati and not Arya Bhagavan. Because here we're talking about the wisdom wing of the practice. So to emphasize that, we have the TI suffix. So that's the title. Um, any question about the title? So an Arya is anyone who has directly realized emptiness. Now, to look at the Heart Sutra, as we said, we have these outlines here from a Tibetan commentary to help us to understand the structure. But also, um, over the page, we have this sort of mind map, which visually can help us to see how the structure of the Heart Sutra is. So let's have a brief look at that. So we see here, there are sort of two parts. There's what's called the prologue, the setting, and then the uh, subject matter. And in the subject matter, we see that there is, it says, Shariputra's question, Avalokiteshvara's response, and then the teacher's affirmation and assembly's delight. So we have first the prologue, which is the setting, is where is this sutra taking place, what's going on, and then the main part of the sutra, what we see, is in the form of a question-answer. We have Chariputra asking a question and Avalokiteshvara making a long reply to that. So this is basically, and then at the end, the, it says the teacher's affirmation. And that's where the Buddha actually says, you know, that well said, well said. And then the assembly's delight at the end. So... What we're going to first look at now is the prologue, the setting, and we see there's two parts to that. There's common and uncommon. So let's go back to the Heart Sutra, have a look at what they are. So the prologue is the setting. And the first paragraph is what's called the common prologue. is what is in common to most sutras. That most sutras will start in the same way. And there are four things here called the four perfect conditions. So this describes four things. When did this sutra teaching take place? Who was the teacher? Where did it happen? Who was present? So here it says, Thus did I hear at one time. Meaning this teaching only took place at, on one occasion. And the teacher here is the Bhagavan. So again, the Bhagavan is another word for the Buddha. Where did this take place? It says, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain in Rajgir. So Rajgir uh, is a place in modern day Bihar in India. 
And ranch gear really means the place or the palace of the king. So ranch gear was the place where the local, the king was living. And the king there at the time was King Bimbasara. And you find that he comes up in a number of different sutras because he was a disciple of the Buddha. And then it said this took place on Mass of Vultures Mountain, sometimes called Vultures Peak. It's a small hill outside of Rajgir. So this teaching of the Heart Sutra took place on this little hill, Vultures Peak, outside of Rajgir. There are a number of different assertions why it's called Vultures Peak. Um, one is that the peak looks like a head of a vulture. I've been there many times, I, I couldn't see that. Another assertion is that there are a lot of vultures circling around at the time of the teaching. Again, I've been there many times. I don't think I've ever seen a vulture circling around, but maybe there was then. I don't know. So there are a number of different assertions why it's called that, but it's a little hill just outside Rajgir. So that's where it took place. Who was present? It says here um, that the Buddha was there together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. So this word that's translated as great community here is Sangha, spiritual community. And when it talks about monks and bodhisattvas, the word monk here is really talking about those who are aspiring to nirvana. And bodhisattvas, of course, are those who are aspiring to enlightenment. So a great number of monks and bodhisattvas were present at the time. So this is called the common prologue, common setting that often a sutra will start by describing those four things. When it took place, who was teaching, where, and who was present. And then the second paragraph, we have the uncommon prologue. And the uncommon prologue is what is specific to this teaching. So let's have a look at what the specific setting is for this teaching. In the second paragraph here, it says... At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. This word profound is often a word used when describing emptiness. Because emptiness is profound in terms of difficult to understand and realise, but it's also profound in terms of the result that we can get from it. So here the word profound is a word for emptiness. So profound perception means that the Bhagavan, the Buddha, was absorbed in a realisation of emptiness. But it says here the Bhagavan, the Buddha, was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Meaning that categories of phenomena are simply different ways of grouping all phenomena. So what it's saying here is that the Buddha was observing the different categories of phenomena and at the same time realising emptiness. That is is something that only a, an enlightened person can do. Because now, as a normal person, either we're seeing the different types of phenomena, or we're absorbed in a realisation of emptiness. And when we're absorbed in emptiness in meditation, nothing else is appearing. So we have to alternate between emptiness and appearing world, backwards and forwards. And then when we, at the point of achieving enlightenment, we, that becomes simultaneous. So as an enlightened person, a Buddha, we can be seeing